So hi everyone, welcome to the February Ethereum.org community call. Uh, we'll start with a quick round of introductions. Uh, after that, Luca is going to spend some time talking about DevConnect and our translator term base. Um, Corwin will provide us an update on our thinking and progress around layer two. We've got a, a pull app. I've got Sam here, but I believe Pablo is actually going to be introducing our redesigned ecosystem support program website. And Sarah from the, the ESP team will be speaking a little bit about the academics grants round that they're just about to start running. Uh, and finally, we've got Paul who will speak a little bit about staking UX and we've got some time for Q&A as well. Um, so I can start quickly with the intros. I'm Joshua, the community lead for Ethereum.org. As always, you can ping me with any ideas or feedback that you have for the community, or if you're interested in finding more ways to contribute to Ethereum.org. Uh, I'll pass it on to Luca. Hey everyone, I'm Luca. Um, I am working on the Ethereum.org translation program. So if you want to get involved, help us translate the website into more languages, or if you are already a translator, have any questions, thoughts, general feedback, feel free to reach out. And I'll pass it on to Paul. I'm Paul here, um, front end dev, been on the team for a little over a year. Um, I'll be chatting with you soon about staking. I uh, hope everyone's having a good day. I'll pass it along to Pablo. Yes. Yeah, Pablo here, uh, front end developer. Um, Basically working on yeah web development uh, for uh, a bunch of years. Uh, now working for decentralized applications and Web3. Uh, yeah, ping me if you are interested in that. Uh, pass it to, I'm not sure who is missing, Sam. Hey, good day, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, yeah, my name's Sam. I'm a web developer for a while now. Um, now also, yeah, team lead on the Ethereum.org team, thinking all things Ethereum.org. Um, I'm also Sam and Jammin uh, on Discord and GitHub. If you ever want to connect, happy to get you involved. I'll pass it over to Nuno. Hello everyone, I'm Nuno. Uh, I'm new to the team, so I'm going to be doing product design and helping out the .org websites and all things related to design. Nice to meet you all. Now I'll pass it to Jacob. Hello everybody, I'm a new product designer just like Nuno. My focus will be more on the user experience of the website. Feel free to chat with me on Discord or in the design channel. And nice to meet you all. Um, Back to you, Sam, I suppose, or Luca. I think we've still got Corwin. Team's getting big. Hey, <laughs> hey guys, um, thanks for joining. I'm Corwin, or Corwin Teams on pretty much all socials. Um, I'm a web developer on Ethereum.org. Um, and yeah, mainly been focusing on Layer 2 stuff lately, which I will talk to um, in a little bit. Um, if you have any questions about development stuff, yeah, definitely feel free to reach out in the code channel or um, DM me if you have any questions around development for Ethereum.org. Um, yeah, pass back to Josh here. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, everyone. I think that's everyone. I'm not sure that I can count that high. Um, so yeah, we've also set up a Slido for the call as normal, and just allows anyone to ask any questions they have for the team in advance. If you check out the community call chat, uh, channel, you can find the link to that if you do have any questions. Um, and once again, I'll just reiterate that this is a community call for Ethereum.org, the website, and we don't represent the, the network or the protocol directly. Um, so with that in mind, try to keep your questions focused on Ethereum.org or things that Ethereum.org can do to support the ecosystem more broadly. Um, yeah, so I'll stop sharing my screen just now. Um, hello. Yes, so uh, first up we have Luca, who is going to talk a little bit about the DevConnect and our translator's term base. 
Sure. Uh, so, as you may know, there will be a new Ethereum event this year called DevConnect. It will take place in Amsterdam in April. Uh, the DevCon team, which is organizing the event, has been kind enough to help us reward some of our top contributors and have reserved spots to the DevConnect co-working space for all of our top POAP holders free of charge. This means that if you hold either our 5 PR, PR POAP given to contributors who have opened 5 PRs in a repo in 2021, or our 10K POAP given to contributors who have translated 10,000 words in our translation program, you can reserve your spot for DevConnect now. Uh, if you are eligible and plan to attend, please reach out to me so you can be added to the list. All you need to do is share your email address so we can share that with the DEFCON team and reserve your spot for the co-working co space. As a side note, there will be several events taking place in Amsterdam that week, like uh, ETH Amsterdam, for example, which may require a separate registration. And I really hope to meet some of our top contributors in Amsterdam. That that should be pretty much it. Just wanted to announce this. Uh, we've already announced it in the announcements channel. Um, and next up, we would like to highlight one of our newest initiative, the the latest in our series of efforts to provide our translators with some high quality resources to make their work easier and further improve the quality of the translations on the website. Specifically, we are working on cleaning up and improving the crowding glossary that the translators can use to find descriptions and establish translations of key terms. Let me share my screen here. Um, so we want to make the glossary as reliable as possible so that the translators can be certain the translations it contains are accurate and use it as a source of truth when translating the website. This will ultimately lead to better quality translations and make translations of key terms more consistent. Uh, so just, just a brief overview of how the crowding glossary works. If you've participated in the translation program before, you're probably familiar with this. Basically, every word that is included in the glossary is underlined in the Crowdin editor. So you can see the description of these terms in the trans and their translation in your language just by hovering over them. Um, you can also search for terms in the term section in the right sidebar, which shows all glossary entries in a particular string. The way we are, we're currently approaching this is we've created several spreadsheets that we are sharing with different parties for input. The one I'm showing right now has been shared with our translators. You can also find a link to this in the community call agenda. Uh, as you can see, it's just a really simple, a simple spreadsheet with some key Ethereum specific terms and fields for translations in numerous languages. If you want to help us with this initiative, please follow the link and add some translations for your language. The instructions on how to fill this out are available in the second tab of the spreadsheet. Once we've gotten some more input, we will sort through the translations and import them into the crowding glossary, which I showed before. So that's the built-in glossary that all the translators see and use by default when translating the website. Um, Thanks to everyone who has already added some translations to this term base and everyone who will be adding them to the future. So we already have quite a few terms in some languages, some not so much. At this point, we would really appreciate your help. Uh, and finally, one last thing I wanted to touch on was just highlighting some of the language updates we've made to the website in February. Uh, it's been a great month for translations on ethereum.org as we have added some completely new languages to the site and also updated a lot of existing translations. Uh, we've had the updated translations for the homepage and site navigation, for example, in over 20 languages. 
also added uh, Georgian to the website for the first time. We have updated the use Ethereum pages, which include some of the most basic pages on the website, like what is Ethereum, what is Ether, wallets, find a wallet, stuff like that in uh, around a dozen languages. Additionally, we updated the use case pages, which cover topics like NFTs, DeFi, DAOs, and plenty of other important topics in some languages. Um, and finally, we are uh, currently in the process of updating the remaining pages in some of our most active languages, like Chinese Simplified, Indonesian, Italian, Portuguese, Brazilian. Um, most of the website has been translated into these languages. So you are, if you are a native speaker of any of these languages, you will be able to browse pretty much the entire website in your native language in the coming days. Um, that should pretty much cover what I wanted to talk about. Just want to end with another big thank you to all of our contributors who make the website great. And a special shout out to our translators for allowing us to make this content available to everyone, regardless of their language. That is the purpose of the translation program. And again, if you're looking to get involved, help us translate the website. We have a translation channel, or you can reach out to me at any time. Awesome. Yeah, Sam here, just to tack onto that real quick with some numbers for you, like big shout out i know there's a lot of translators on the call right now like thank you guys for doing what you do i know the large majority of you are just volunteering your time um for a long time you know english has dominated traffic on ethereum.org but it's cool to see that basically every single month we're hitting record months in terms of just like non-english page views um we had almost 600,000 in february um and yeah, to see like English as as the majority of traffic going down over time, like for the first time ever last month, it was under 85% of total page views. Um, and we can just see, you know, like record months for specific languages across the board. So really huge to see like continued adoption and like people clearly gaining value from all the translations you're doing. So appreciate you guys. Hey, thanks, Sam. Thanks, Luca. Um, yeah, and big thanks to the DevCon team as well for arranging this for us and, and these sort of incentives. Um, if you have any questions related to DevConnect, the term base or the translation program, just more generally, feel free to ping Luca. Moving along a little bit, I think Corwin is going to provide us an overview on our progress and his thoughts around the Layer 2 resources and some work he's been doing on that lately. For sure, just gonna share my screen here. All right, so um, as you might have seen on our roadmap, we're looking to expand our resources on layer twos. Um, I think it's pretty well known now at this point that um, using mainnet on Ethereum is uh, both cost prohibitive for uh, everyday user, um, gas fees are, going up um, and block space is full on Ethereum. Um, basically transactions are getting expensive because there's so much demand for it. And with that, um, there are scaling solutions coming online called layer twos, which um, looking to bring more information and help onboard users to uh, these networks. Um, so with that, we're working on a kind of beginner to intermediate friendly use Ethereum page on layer twos. Um, what we're looking to provide for information on this page is basically walking through what is a layer one? Like what does it mean to be a layer one? Um, and why do we need layers twos? And so going into some of the main talking points of faster transactions, um, inheriting security on the the layer from the layer one. Um, lower transaction fees, application specific uh, layer twos like Immutable X, just trying to highlight why users would and should use layer twos. And then going into what are layer twos? What are 
what our rollups is. That's like how layer twos are being built. Um, and um, basically section on do some of your own research. We're going to be highlighting L2Beat a lot on this page. It's a great resource for learning about risk and technical assessments of layer twos. Um, and it's a great team there uh, who's capable of auditing these projects. So I highly recommend that resource when looking into layer twos. Um, Want to touch a little bit on like what's the difference between a layer two, uh, Alt L1, and a side chain? They're very distinct differences, but it's kind of kind of gray when you're first looking into some of this information. So we want to try and help clear up some of that uh, confusion for users. Next, we want to go into like how do you use a layer two? So if you have funds in your wallet, how do you bridge over onto a layer two from mainnet? And if your funds are on an exchange, how would you uh, get from an exchange onto layer two? So there's going to be some L2s that are supported from exchanges. For example, Arbitrum, you can uh, withdraw and deposit on uh, exchanges like Coinbase and Binance. Um, so looking to have a component there to help uh, let a user be like, I have my funds on Binance, for example, and then showing that you can withdraw deposit from there. Um, and if not, we'll come up with some information on how to get your funds off of an exchange and then bridging up from there. Um, as well, we want to highlight what are some different types of layer twos. So as I was kind of mentioning before, there's going to be generalized layer twos, like the Arbitrums and the Optimisms, where dApps are being deployed on these. Um, they're very similar to mainnet, where you can publish a smart contract onto them and uh, use them just like mainnet today, except on a scaled layer two solution. As well as there's application specific layer twos, looking at like the immutable Xs and what they're doing with the NFT space and highlighting um, highlighting projects that are very application specific. And then looking to provide tools and tips for users to be as effective as possible on layer two. So what I mean by that is like, um, what wallets will support layer twos or how, how can you import an RPC for your wallet to be able to use a layer two in MetaMask, for example. Um, what are some good wallet managers? So as your funds are being distributed onto different networks, how can you get a holistic view of your, um, your assets among all these networks? So looking at highlighting like Xerion and Zapper and the bank, um, which lets you go to one application and see all your assets on all the networks that they are currently supporting. Um, Highlighting the DAP portals. So for example, Arbitrum and Optimism have really good pages highlighting the ecosystem that currently exists on those networks. Um, so trying to make it easier for users to go to a web page uh, like uh, portal.arbitrum.1, I think is theirs, but go linking out to those pages there so users can get a holistic view of like the ecosystem which they may be entering. Um, as well, want to highlight like the different fees that exist on these different L2s. So linking out to L2 fees, um, as well as explorers for these L2s. Um, so you couldn't use just etherscan.io. You'd have to find, for example, arbitrum.etherscan.io. Um, so linking out to block explorers that make it easier for users to um, utilize the network and uh, have the same tools that they currently have for mainnet. And as well, want to link out to token lists that exist on the appropriate L2s. Um, I know when I onboarded on L2, I was looking to get certain assets on that layer um, and trying to find the contract for those tokens um, was a bit of a challenge. So looking to try and bring some of that information into Ethereum.org to make it easier for users to get that information from a, a trusted resource so that they're not you know, worried about finding the wrong token address that's spoofing some project that you want to buy on an L2. Um, as well as we're going to have some frequently asked questions that maybe don't quite fit into the content that um, we're looking that I went over, but would still be kind of frequently asked and deserves a spot on the website, even if it can't be um, integrated with the content that's already been written. Um, and as well, we'll have a final note on some scaling that's coming, for example, sharding. Um, 
looking to highlight that. Um, in addition to this use Ethereum page, we've done some work on um, breaking out our developer docs for layer two. So before, when you were on this page, under this scaling tab, we had a layer two um, page and that layer two page included all the content for what is a layer two um, optimistic rollups and ZK rollups. Uh, what we're doing now is layer two is our scaling solution. So we've included that now onto just the base scaling page. And we're working with L2 projects in the space um, to help bring more uh, fleshed out content for optimistic and zero knowledge uh, rollups. Um, so looking to also build out our technical resources on these pages, uh, working with the experts in the space. Um, that's basically what we have in mind and what we've been working on. I definitely would like to hear some feedback from you guys if you think that we're on the right track with this. Um, we're really hoping to provide a good resource for, um, like I was saying, beginners and intermediates and how to help onboard them into the space. As, um, as we all know, gas fees are very high. And this is kind of the next evolution for where users should be using Ethereum moving forward, as you'll get a better user experience both through faster transactions. So your interface will be like much more snappy like you're used to on a, on a Web2 product or cheaper gas fees, which makes this a way more accessible space. And you're still inheriting all the security from Ethereum. Um, so there's nothing to worry about when it comes to the security of your assets there. Um, with that, I'll pass it back to Joshua. Awesome, thank you, Corwin. Yeah, really excited about getting this page out in March. Um, if anyone has any thoughts or ideas about how to make this content better, we'd love to hear from you. Um, or even if you have questions around layer twos, please ask them in the Ethereum channel. Um, and we can then use that to better serve users on this page, hopefully. And um, cool, so next up, we've got Poaps. I'm going to share my screen. Yeah, um, so here are instructions for claiming the POAPs. Um, if you click on the view um, video, you'll be able to see. Uh, and I've just put the passcode into this Notion doc as well. So to claim your POAP, you just go on our Discord server. In the top right, or just under the Ethereum.org team, actually it will be now, um, you'll see the POAP bot. If you send a direct message to the POAP bot with the secret word, which is L222, so that's capital L222, um, the POAP bot should respond to you, send you your claim link, and then you can claim that. Um, so I'll just leave it a minute or two just as everyone's doing that. Yeah, so one last time, the instructions for claiming your POAP are on the screen now, but just on the Discord server, if you click on the POAP bot, send it a direct message with the secret word, which is L222, and uh, the POAP bot will send you a link back that you can claim your POAP with. Awesome, I think we can move on. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Um, next up, we have... Pablo, um, who's going to be speaking a little bit about the Ecosystem Support Programs website redesign. And following after Pablo, we're going to have Sarah who'll talk a little bit about the academic grant trend. Yes. Uh, thanks, Josh. Uh, share my screen. 
public. Can you turn your mic up by any chance? A little quiet. Can you hear me? Hello, hello. Yeah, I'm not sure if I can. Still pretty quiet. If you're having problems with this, you can use Discord uh, in the browser instead of the app. That usually works better. <laughs> or you can just yell into the microphone. <laughs> or just yell. <laughs> can you still hear me a little bit? Hello? Yeah, just a little quiet. Uh, OK. Well, I, I will try to, to talk a, bit, a little bit louder. Um, so. Yeah, this we have uh, released a new version of the ESP site. Uh, this is not uh, specific related to if.org, but we as a team in Ethereum.org, we we help maintain different sites across the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, so this is one of them. This is the ESP program site. Uh, we released this new version, uh, new design. Um, a bit of context on the ESP program. Um, the ESP program, basically, uh, the goal is to provide funds and support in different, in different ways uh, Ethereum-related projects in the ecosystem. Um, and yeah, this is the site. This is, uh, it's pretty small. Uh, you can enter this and learn more about the the ESP goal and and role. Um, if you are uh, a person or if you are working in a project related to Ethereum, you can apply uh, for the different type of, of grants that the ESP program is offering. Is they they have? Uh, you have these three different type of grants, you can enter each one of them, you can read and learn more about them and and then you can you can apply here. Um, yeah, that's pretty much the site. Uh, you can learn more here in the, in the about section. And the last thing to, to mention is that if you find any bug or you, you see something that is not Working as expected, you can raise uh, an issue in the ESP website repo, or you can you can provide some feedback uh, on our Discord channels. We will really appreciate that. Uh, not sure if any, anyone wants to add something to to ESP. If not, then I'm back to you, uh, sir. Looks like it. Um, yeah, so thanks very much for giving us a quick run through of that, Pablo. Looks absolutely gorgeous. Um, next up, we've got Sarah, who's going to talk a little bit about the ecosystem support to academic scratch round. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Josh. Um, yeah, so my name is Sarah, and I'm part of the Ethereum Foundation team. Uh, what I wanted to share with you today is that the Ethereum Foundation just launched a new wave of grants, specifically target, uh, targeting uh, Ethereum-related academic research. So basically, we will be supporting researchers in universities, think tanks, um, PhD students and uh, research centers, and others interested in creating open source knowledge um, to further advance the ecosystem. So this grants round has up to 700,000 um, US dollars in total, and it is live now on the Thought.org page in the grants section and also in the ESP um, that Pablo just showed. Um, so I invite you all to apply and share with your uh, networks. Um, this grants round is open until April 22nd, so uh, make sure you submit on time uh, if you have any project proposals. Uh, and again, feel free to share among the networks who may be interested in um, applying for these grants. I'm happy to clarify any questions that you may have. Um, and if not, then I will um, 
uh, gets back to Josh. Um, but let me know if you have any questions. Yeah, I'm just opening the floodgates just now. I need to unmute everyone. Um, but yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free just to unmute and ask. Yeah, so you should be able to unmute now. So yeah, if you do have any questions or if you want to ask in the community call chat, I'm sure Sid is happy to take private messages as well. Okay. Um so finally then we can we can move on. We've got Paul who will be talking a little bit about our user experience for staking and how we're working to improve that. Yes, hey guys, how's everyone doing? Give me one sec here, I'll share a screen. Let's see, Let's see a screen. Okay, so yeah, my name's Paul, front end developer with the Ethereum.org team. I'm going to chat a little bit about the topic of staking today. Um, quick disclaimer, of course, this is just the Ethereum.org website team. I'm speaking on behalf of this is not a protocol level discussion here. Um, that being said, we're trying to open up uh, staking for as many people as possible, essentially. When the beacon chain went live in December 2020, uh, 32 ETH was required. At that time, it was a little bit more reasonable if you go back a couple of years. Uh, for users to accumulate that much. We're trying to make that shift now towards focusing more on solo staking, and, or sorry, uh, pooled staking options, basically, because most people at this point are, are not going to be able to contribute a full 32 ETH. Um, so that, that focus is shifting, and we are planning on updating this page with some more resources. Um, not much has changed so far. Mm -hmm. Essentially, this is the existing page. Um, if you notice down here, we do have the two main paths, 32 ETH versus less than 32 ETH. We're looking to revamp this a little bit, and on the less than 32 ETH side, you'll see we have had a PR from a community member who updated with adding Rocket Pool to this in a, in a very simple fashion. We're going to be expanding this a little bit more to, to emphasize Rocket Pool to users. Um, Rocket Pool is one of the options out there that's very low barrier to entry for people. It's been audited by multiple firms. It's got an active bug bounty out there quite decentralized as far as the node operators are concerned, and it offers users the ability to self-custody their funds uh, and still maintain liquidity through what's called the RETH token, which represents basically your, your staked ETH plus the rewards that have been earned by that ETH, essentially. And it, and it gives a very good option for people to join into the staking community without necessarily having to run hardware. Um, so there's going to be some more resources on that coming up. Um, this is actually the Rocket Pool page right there, um, and I will drop in the chat some links for everybody that I'm going to go through real quick. Um, so this is this is Rocket Pool. Uh, like I said, definitely encourage you to check it out. There'll be more information on this coming as far as uh, a pretty solid option for people to stake. Uh, going down the list, we also still want to encourage people to do home staking and do it in the way that's most decentralized and beneficial for the network. Uh, Sterium is one option that's going to be discussed uh, on the site at some point soon. Uh, Sterium is basically a GUI. It's a graphical user interface that you can use to tap into a, a node that you may have. So you got a little computer box in there running Linux. Uh, you can use this from your Mac or Windows PC or whatever to tap into your node and have a nice graphical interface. So this is a nice option that's out there to make staking easier for users now. Um, of course, there's always the command line. If you're familiar with that, if you have 32 ETH, I'd strongly encourage you to take that approach. Um, but if you're not familiar with the command line, you want to get involved with running a different type of node, uh, there's this page as well, of course, the run a node page, which went live a little over a month ago. I encourage you to check that out too. Um, and I do want to chat a little bit then going on to the discussion of client diversity. This is something we're going to be adding more information to this site as well. Uh, right now, there's a there are multiple clients, uh, consensus layer clients, and Prism is the one that has, as you see here, a little over a supermajority, over 66%. So we're trying as a community to decrease Prism's majority here. It's not because Prism's bad. Uh, many people have heard this before. Prism's an amazing client, but they're all really amazing clients. And having Prism be used by over two-thirds of the network puts the network at risk. 
Um, and if you're not familiar with how, I'd encourage you to check this page out here. It's listed on the, the community call chat channel. Um, and some more places you can go to get involved with this type of stuff. Of course, the ETH Staker website, and you can join their Discord. Um, there's going to be some new test nets coming up. There's the, the Kiln test net will be starting soon. I'd encourage anybody who's interested in this stuff to check that out. And then we're heading on towards hopefully Gurley and Prodder merge and uh, Mainnet Beacon Chain hopefully come the summer. Again, this is just my hopeful thoughts. Um, this is another article here on Reddit that that I've been kind of that Superfizz put out recently that I really like. I'd encourage people to check out as well. This is um, aiding in our decisions, as, uh, to be honest, as far as how to organize some of the content going forward. Really good article he put out emphasizes the most important ways you can impact the network at the top and kind of works its way down. So definitely check that out. And of course, there's the whole state of the stake playlist on YouTube if anybody's curious as well. These are just some other resources for people in the meantime and look forward to some changes on the page soon. That's all I got. Any questions for me? Yeah, we're about to go into Q&A, but I guess now's a good time if you've got any questions for Paul specifically about what he just spoke about or anything else that we've just covered, feel free to speak up or or ask them in the community call chat. We also do have our Slido, which um, someone can kindly drop a link in the community call chat. So if you don't feel like speaking up, you can drop a question in there too, which I know some of you are already done. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Okay, cool. Um, so we'll spend the remainder of the call on Q&A. Um, we have a list here ready to go, but as I said, please feel free to add some more. Um, we've got a question from Stephen Reinhardt. When does proof of stake on mainnet start? Do it already, please. Thank you. ASAP. Uh, I think Paul's presentation he just done already yeah. covers this, but um, we're looking at proof of stake in Q2. Specifically, as far as I know, um, we're looking at around June. Um, but again, it's not something specifically that Ethereum.org deals with. Uh, I don't right. know if anyone else in the team. Paul, wanna go ahead? Yeah, I'll just add to that. Just keep in mind, of course, this is the core developers who are working on this. There is no specific date set. There just isn't. Um, like I mentioned before, uh, the test nets are rolling along currently. Kintsugi's uh, kind of being deprecated and gonna be switched to Kiln. Like I said, after that, it sounds like the plan I've heard is moving on to the Gurley and Prodder test nets and officially merging those as one of the last steps before mainnet. Um, but that being said, there isn't an exact date that I'm aware of. Uh, there is the difficulty bomb, which is set to go off, uh, I think in June, July time period is when we're gonna start feeling that. So I would anticipate some type of decision by then, but yeah, ultimately it's not up to us. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna share a video of uh, Danny Ryan's talk at ETH Denver. He talks a little bit about, like, there's no exact date, obviously, like that was just mentioned, but he does talk about their progress and how close that uh, that they are when it comes to it. And that they're feeling pretty comfortable with the current difficulty bomb, but um, obviously that's subject to change pending bugs in uh, in the testnet. And I've also dropped a link to the merge uh, mainnet readiness checklist, which is a public GitHub repo. Anyone can follow to see what still needs to be done before everything's ready for the merge. Cool. Thank you. Um, next up, Anonymous has dropped us a link. Blockchain and its community effect. Um, I had a look in advance, so the question of this seems to basically be are contentious forks good for the health of a blockchain protocol? Um, so we actually have a really good page on 
ethereum.org on ethereum governance that you should check out um, that explains on it the utility of forking and why it is important. Um, personal opinion, but I'd argue absolutely uh, if there's strong disagreements about the ability. Uh, just, like Within the network, if there is a strong disagreement, then being able to fork or at least having the threat of forking allows for compromise. Otherwise, it's just like this tyrannical majority rule. And I've seen a bunch of people make the argument that Ethereum today is much stronger because of the Ethereum classic fork as well. Um, anyone have anything else they want to add? Yeah, I just, um, sorry, Sam here. Just add real quick, I think that Reddit thread, there was a good answer of like distinguishing between the types of forks of like planned forks that are non-contentious and like a planned upgrade, such as the upcoming merge to proof of stake on Ethereum versus what might be a contentious fork and something that results in the uh, in the actual outcome of like two distinct blockchain communities. Um, cool, Misha, I see the OP of the thread. Good to have you here. Um, I'll share a couple books that I've found interesting kind of related to this. Um, one is the block size war. Um, that's a book about somewhat like the history of forks within the Bitcoin ecosystem. I thought it was really interesting to kind of just like follow the history. It includes a lot of primary resources of just like discussions in the forums, debating the Bitcoin block size, how that ultimately resulted in, you know, Bitcoin cash. SVU, all that good stuff. Um, and there's some some pretty solid kind of like biographies of Ethereum at this point. Um, the Infinite Machine being one. I know Lor Shin just published a new book that I haven't read yet. Um, but that could also be a great way to kind of dig into the history of these protocols and to just see like how these forks have actually impacted them. I know there's a lot of debate on, you know, is forking healthy? Is it not? Um, kind of hard to say. I feel like it's not necessarily a black and white thing, but certainly an interesting topic. Um, and yeah, cool to hear you're digging into that. Yeah, and I just finished Laura Shin's new book and I'd also highly recommend that as well. And it does get into the, the Ethereum classic work too. Um, next up, we've got Brayton. Are there any are there any areas in specific that Ethereum.org would like to see greater community engagement and contribution? Loads. Um, I'd be curious if anyone else in the team had any thoughts here. For me, um, it looks like in the next question we'll get into design a little bit, which I think is something that we could do a lot better with. We've also had a lot of extremely successful content collaborations and. Um, but generally, they've been one off. So I'd really love to see more people contributing writing and ideas for articles and documentation. Uh, anyone else on the team? Yeah, I'll second that. Uh, this is Paul, I think. Uh, I think we got more yeah, documentation. Okay. Sorry, I got somebody not muted. Um, but yeah, I, I think. Um, yeah, but not in the. Onboarding and education is one of the biggest things that, that comes to mind for me. I know that's not necessarily super specific, but anything that can be done to take somebody who's not familiar or has questions about this ecosystem and giving them the education they need, the tools they need, um, and the, the friendly support they need in order to, to become a part of this community, that's what I would like to see. Anyone else? <laughs> I think we can get into the design question because it's along the same lines as well. Um, so Scott asks, I'm enjoying the new design focus channel on Discord. What plans do the team have to create more engagement in the future? Um, obviously at the start of the call, we introduced Nico and Jakob, our new designers, um, very early days, but we've spoke about a couple of things already about like, working in public, sharing designs of the community that they're working on, potentially office hours, things like that. Um, obviously, we'll keep you posted and always open to it, any ideas. Uh, does, do Jakob or you know, either of you want to weigh in on that at all? 
Hey, I'll just say something real quick. This is Sam again of like, Scott, really glad you brought up this question. Thanks for, thanks for bringing it to the table. And I know you've been one of the few designers who have like found a way to come in and contribute with the pop designs and like the community page redesign. So if you do have input on, yeah, like how to get more designers from the community involved, I think we'd love to hear from you. Um, if any of you folks have followed our team's roadmap over the past two quarters, like you will have seen, we've been working hard on actually like hiring product designers um, up until now. We just haven't had that resource internally on our core team. Um, thankful to say, like after a long road of <laughs> interviews um, and meeting people, like Nuno and Jakob, who just introduced themselves today, like they literally just started this week. Um, Tuesday was their first day. So um, they probably don't have a ton of just like strong opinions on how to properly engage the community just yet. But I can assure you like that is something they're excited to think about. And yeah, if you folks on the call do have input on ways that we could, you know, open up um, the work we do from a design standpoint on ethereum.org, how we could collect input um, from you and get feedback from you folks, I think that'd be great. Um, so just a quick preface, but yeah, I'll hand it over to, to Nino or Jakob if you guys do want to touch on anything. Yeah, for sure. This is Nuno. Uh, I'm really excited to join the team. Uh, we've done this week, like Sam they said. And I know that we have a lot of work to do ahead of us. I have a long road map. Uh, and looking forward to work with the community to to help us uh, bring new ideas and new approaches to design. Uh, we're thinking about uh, office hours and uh, some open some Figma files or so. Uh, but we haven't touched that uh, in detail. So uh, stay tuned for more on this. Awesome. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Nuno. Um, we're getting pretty tight on time, so I'm going to skip over some questions that are maybe not the most relevant. Um, Rory is asking, aside from the translation program, does Ethereum.org have any goals for helping Ethereum reach and expand to the next billion users? I think this is a really good question that I don't have like a fantastic answer for. Uh, I think a lot of the work that we already do Know, building out the resources and engaging with the community and getting the community to help us um, expand the knowledge about Ethereum that we have on the site is like a really great starting point. But there's lots of different initiatives um, happening as well that we aren't related to because we're obviously just focused on um, Ethereum.org. Does anyone else want to speak to this a bit? I'll throw in some words to Paul again. Um, certainly the Ethereum Foundation as a whole has efforts to pursue this type of activity, you know, looking to what can we do to bring in the next billion users? Uh, that question exactly. Um, as far as our team, I know diversity certainly been something that's been a, a, been a topic recently amongst the Ethereum Foundation as well as our specific team, something that we, you know, admit uh, we have a little bit of work to do. Uh, certainly we got a, a growing team now. Um, some of you may notice that it's pretty much all guys at this point on our team specifically, and that is something that personally I would like to see expanded, see uh, more diversity amongst our team and the whole Ethereum Foundation, um, not just culturally, but also, you know, gender as well, getting some more diversity amongst our users so we can help impact that additional billion people. Um, and I think that's one one direction we need to go. Yeah, thanks, Paul. I think it's a great question, Rory. I would just add that overall, like we try to stay somewhat focused as the Ethereum.org team on just like creating educational content that helps onboard anyone to Ethereum. And yeah, like getting that website translated into as many languages as possible um, is a big part of doing that. So open to any ideas on how we could help Ethereum reach and expand the next billion users. I would just, yeah, tack on to Paul's point that like there are other teams within the Ethereum Foundation, um, the grants program that um, Sarah and Pablo touched on. There's actually a team focused on what we call local grants. So actually doing more proactive outreach to communities across the globe, particularly underrepresented areas and like helping 
accelerate adoption and just like education on that front. Um, we actually have a team within the Ethereum Foundation called the Next Billion, um, which is a, a somewhat of a fellowship program that focuses on, yeah, like empowering um, entrepreneurs across the world to to help address some of these challenges. So in short, like it's a much bigger problem than I think the Ethereum.org team can solve on its own. I think what we try to focus on most is like highlighting those programs that do exist to give them more exposure and make sure that people are discovering them so that if you're an entrepreneur who wants to help solve these problems, if you're, you know, an academic researcher looking for funding to help on this stuff, or, you know, translators looking to get involved, no matter who you are, the goal is for us to like help you find the project that can, that can push this stuff forward. Um, but if you do have ideas on how we could do a better job of that, I mean, that's definitely what we're here for. Yeah, and I think also to add to that, like when we build out our roadmaps, it's something we do somewhat keep in mind when we're trying to create content. So um, some examples that we have on this roadmap for this quarter specifically are um, helping revamp like the wallets page and layer twos and um, real world like use case stuff that users as they onboard into Ethereum um, will be using. Um, so trying to like provide good onboarding content for uh, for users who are learning to like get into the space. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, we're very, very tight on time. I'll ask the team to maybe have a quick look through the remaining questions. And if there's anything that you feel is worthwhile answering, feel free to hop in and answer. Um, we've got a question from Anonymous. I haven't visited the site in a while. What's new? Lots. Um, we've got a new run a node page to teach you how to run a node. A new page on client diversity, which is getting increasingly important as we approach the merge. Uh, we've rebranded re -branded away from Ethereum 2.0 terminology. We've massively improved coverage across 42 languages. Uh, if someone could pop a link to our roadmap and the community call chat channel. I think that covers just about most of the things that we're working on. I could throw in an answer to one of these questions too. Um, I see another one by Anonymous. When soul is taking, I feel the penalties are unfair. If your validator goes down to your internet or power outage, other plans to reduce the penalties. Um, honestly, my understanding is no. In fact, the Altair upgrade that occurred a couple months ago actually increased those penalties to their, I believe their final levels. Um, I'll drop a link in the chat as well if you want to read up more. That's the knowledge base page for Beacon Chain. Um, you can take a look through there. It does go through the the penalties, the different types of penalties and why they exist. Um, keep in mind, this is what makes a proof of stake system work. There needs to be penalties. There needs to be repercussions for users who misbehave. Um, and that's how the system is going to work. So as far as I understand, no, there's not going to be any reduction to these penalties going forward. And like I used to think the same, uh, probably the same sort of mental model that you have just now. And I think Paul done a really got good job explaining that to me. But you might have a misunderstanding between how staking penalties work for being offline and staking penalties work for uh, submitting incorrect votes. They're completely yeah, two yeah. different things. Real quick touch on that. There's a difference between leaking some elixir be, by being offline, which is a very mild penalty compared to an actual malicious act, something that's threatening to the network that results in what's called slashing, which is a totally different penalty that kicks you out of the network. That's a much more severe penalty and typically does not happen just by accident. So not something you need to be terribly worried about if you're looking to stake and the leaking penalties are very mild. Um, they recover just as fast as you lost them basically. Great, thank you, Paul. Sorry for anyone who asked questions that we didn't get to. Um, feel free to pop questions in the community call chat and we'll try and respond to them after the call, but that's just about all we've got time for. Um, thanks so much for everyone for joining us, for taking the time out of your day to spend this hour with us. And we hope it's been educative and informative. Um, yeah, and we'll be back towards the end of this month. So we'll probably see a lot of you again here in three to four weeks time. everyone thanks for joining thanks everyone have a good day
Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.